Good evening and welcome to the Liquid Antiquarium, which is not a proper history show about booze. It's not proper because we are not professional historians. While we are professionals of the booze trade, long time standing, we are amateurs. We are not professionals. We are keen, enthusiastic antiquarians who like to get our hands dusty and, and root around old archives and, and leaf through yellowed pieces of parchment. And we hope that these prime resources will inform us and allow us to tell, retell stories that we think maybe have been badly told or tell stories that have never been told. And I, Dave, am delighted that you are doing the Highland Clearances <laughs> and Whiskey for three reasons I could think of. Yeah. The first, <laughs> the first one is it is massive. It is this daunting iceberg and actually an iceberg with a pretty sizable chunk above the water and then this menacing uh, lurking heap of emotion below the, below the surface also. And so I'm glad I'm not attempting it and I'm so <laughs> grateful you are. Um, number two, the second reason is I had noticed. So I obviously, I grew up in England. I went to uh, state school in England and through that system, I enjoyed history, but we never learned anything about the Highland Clearances. But then I, I've been up here 20 years and obviously keen on whiskey, obviously keen on history. And I read some context to uh, the whiskey industry to try and you know round my understanding of it. And I had noticed that even though there is an almost perfect overlap, geographically speaking, and in terms of time, with this rise of the whiskey industry, uh, this professionalization and then this rise of the industry. And even though we have this perfect overlap, people just didn't seem to talk about it in whiskey books. I've no idea why, and I'm really interested to find out if you, if you get to the bottom of that, but also to see your take on it. And then I'll say the third reason is because if I was presenting it, uh -oh. it would sound really bad in an English accent. I just, <laughs> I just think it would. Um, <laughs> so I was uh, thinking of doing it in Gaelic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, you know that no, no. with that accent, you'll be fine. So, uh, so I'm so excited about tonight's episode. And another reason why I'm excited is, as you see here, in our glass, we are drinking. Arden Merkin single malt, which, uh, if I could just say a few words before you kick off, Dave, about Arden Merkin. Firstly, thank you. I'm going to raise a toast to Alex, Connell, Graham, Antonia, uh, Keith, all the, all the great, Gordon, all the great people at Adelphi and Arden Merkin Distillery for, um, for sponsoring us and sending us, sending us a whiskey. It's really, really helpful for us and allows us to uh, invest in more old documents and things. Um, and I think uh, the Merkin, it's fair to say, Dave, is, is it's still, it's like some, there's some new cool kid has suddenly moved to the area and gone to school and come to the school and everyone wants to be friends with this new cool kid. Yeah. That's Arden the Merkin and a few others. And actually, there's some people having to wait their turn a bit for a bottle. Um, they're producing reasonable amounts, but um, it's gone fantastically well at the beginning. Everyone can settle down, they're making plenty, you'll get your chance when the bars reopen, there'll be some in the bars. But it's already making a name for itself with quality as well as the excitement and, and, and the desirability of it. And it's, they're kind of typifying what people see as a kind of West Coast style, whether that's down to geography or anything, but um, it's got this kind of salinity, this little bit of smoke, but not too much smoke. And it, it does make you think of these uh, long days on the West Coast in the rain. Um, so, yeah, and it's got that kind of West Coast filth just lurking in there. Uh, which is yeah, but... yeah. No, it was my whiskey of the year last year, you know. Hands was down. it? So, yeah. And this the second batch. This and it's amazing, you know. Love it, love it. And Ardnamurkin is appropriate as well because Ardnamurkin will will crop up uh, a couple of times uh, in the in the the wanderings through through the clearances, or not just clearances. Yes, of course, of course. Improvements also. Improvement. Um, and uh, and I suppose if just a final word. Well, we'll come to this, but. 
in terms of sense of place. Um, you know, Ardenberg and the distillery has this, um, and uh, and people are already loving it for that. So, Dave. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you got you got a. Uh, a, a, a major bit of research, I think, to, um, I know you've been working super hard on this, so uh, let's get on. Yeah, that's, that's, thanks, Arthur. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I too sort of have noticed over the years that, that there, there was no mention of, of this, uh, and, and I've often thought, about, why is there no mention of this? Because, you know, you hear about, you know, the odd clearance distillery coming up, but it's kind of either washed away and you think, well, maybe is that just... Uh, you know, the, the owners of said distillery is kind of being a little bit wary and a little bit scared about, uh, about actually identifying these things as clearance distilleries, or has nobody really looked into it? Uh, and there isn't that much work. And, and, and what I found fascinating about when I was going going through uh, all, all the texts, uh, contemporary, you know, modern interpretations uh, as well as, as the original text, how little whiskey is mentioned. But the more I got into it, uh, the more I realised that whiskey actually is a marker for for the improvements uh, and the clearances. By improvements, I'm meaning the, the agrarian revolution. And the agrarian revolution and improved agriculture is the stimulus for the clearances taking place. Although, though perhaps, I mean, the, the, there may be people uh, out there who might not know about the clearances because, you know, I wasn't necessarily, I wasn't really taught about it in, when I was at school. Uh, but then I, I, I began to learn about it. it. Began to become more, more common. You know, the people began began discussing it. Uh, but it was really only when I went up to Scourie to to my old friend Les Oman, who, who was working up at Scourie, uh, and we went to a harbour close to Scourie. It's right up there in the north northwest coast in Assent. Uh, that and touching the ring on this on this this wharf, this iron ring on the wharf where where the emigration ship left from. That's when it that's when it became tangible. That's when it became palpable. And you, you kind of began to realise that the reason that these land lands are empty is because they have been emptied. Uh, so anyway, that's what the clearances are. The, the clearances really refer to the mass depopulation of Scotland's rural areas from really the early 18th century right up into the kind of mid 19th century, kind of reaching a peak in, in the, the first, yeah, from about 1815 onwards. Uh, I, I, and I, I, as we'll find out actually, the, the, the greatest emigration actually took place after the clearances had finished uh, in, in, the, in the 1850s, but we'll, we'll touch on that. Uh -huh. Anyway, uh, let's get started. Because it, this is a, this is also a talk about agriculture, and what we've done so far, and I think what a lot of whisky historians have done, and quite rightly so, is looking at whisky as a as a commercial history, you know, as the building of an industry, uh, and in that it's forgotten that whisky is also an agricultural product, and it kind of straddles the, the two camps. But, you know, it is an agricultural product. It's made from barley, for goodness sake. You know, so the growing of the barley, how the barley is grown, where the barley is grown, is, you know, it, it's tied up in, in the history of farming in Scotland. So by looking at it this way, I, I hope to kind of redress that. I, I hope to kind of allow people to begin to think once again of, of whiskey as an agricultural product. And the way in which agriculture changed had an impact on the way that the whiskey industry began to develop. A quick kind of overview to, to begin with uh, on the kind of class structure of Scottish agriculture in the 18th century. Uh, at the top are going to be your grand landowners. Uh, under them are going to be a, a class called the taxmen. Uh, that's T-A-C-K, uh, mm -hmm. the taxmen, who had the tack or, or, or the rent or the lease of a substantial amount of the land which was owned by the landowner. So they were kind of the middlemen. And they then leased out farms to subtenants and took the rent from the subtenants. So most of their income was actually coming coming, coming from, from rental. And underneath the subtenants is another class of, of people called the cotters, uh, C-O-T-T-A-R-S, uh, who are the rural proletariat, if you want, you want to call it that way. The important element about this is that all these people, right down to the cotters, all had access to land. It's like smaller rents of land uh, as you move through, but everybody had access to land. And 
you mentioned sense of place with, 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 with Arthur Merkin there. And the attachment to land uh, is very, very important, especially once we begin to, to move up north. But we're going to be moving from kind of south to north. And if you look at the way in which uh, the land was farmed in those days, you know, the, the old field workings, uh, it was kind of divided into three. There was uh, the infield, which was the best land, and that was kind of what almost like, like a garden. Then there was the outfield, and that was kind of poorer land. It was, it was more extensive. It was less cultivated. Uh, and then there was grazing rights, and each of the tenants were, was given a specific number of, of beasts, whether that's horses or cattle, cattle especially, maybe some sheep. Uh, to prevent any overgrazing uh, take place. And, and you'll see there that those kind of lines, those kind of ripples across the landscape there, that, that's Addington, which we'll come to in, in more detail in a second. Uh, and so these, these were kind of the long planting strips, uh, which, which was common all across Scotland. Uh, there was no drainage ditches uh, until the kind of the, the, the mid, mid 18th century. So uh, the, the, by piling the, the soil, uh, the fertile, soil up that allowed uh, natural drainage uh, to take place. But the sharing of this land, this kind of communal ownership of land, allowed all the people, and Scotland's a rural community, it's a rural nation at, at this point, it allowed people to produce food for their own needs. So kind of uh, this method of farming essentially just kind of met the needs of a population. But by the beginning of the 18th century, this is beginning to change. And my argument here is that whiskey's fortunes are inextricably bound up by the agrarian revolution, or as it becomes known, improvements, improved uh, agriculture. And one of the things, and it's something that's been brought up by, by uh, Professor Tom Devine, Sir Tom Devine, uh, in his great, uh, quite, quite recent book, uh, just called The Clearances, I, I urge you, if you're interested to, to read it, is that the lowland, the, the clearances are always referred to as, as a highland phenomenon. But they started in the lowlands. As many people were cleared from the lowlands as were cleared from the highlands. But it started earlier and it lasted a lot longer in the lowlands. And the impact of it wasn't as horrendous and as visible uh, as it was in the highlands. But we will see that the improvements are going to be starting in the most fertile land, which is basically on the, the, the lowland strip of, of Scotland. Uh, so this is this is a, a map from the making of the Highland economy. Uh, and you can see that, that on, on the right-hand side of Scotland there, now that kind of lowland plain, which goes all the way from like Berwickshire, basically through the Lothians, uh, up the east coast, uh, up to the Murray Firth, and then uh, again, uh, up the East Coast into Ross and Cromarty, into Sutherland, uh, and a little bit of Caithness as well. And it kind of drifted into Perthshire as well. So that's the, the most fertile uh, uh, arable land in Scotland. And the improvements basically start in the south and begin to move, begin to move north. And, and it's all... Think, sorry. Sorry, I think at this point, I, I remember reading also that um, people were coming from all over Europe at the period you're talking about to see yeah. some of this lowland farming because... The techniques were so impressive and mm. it was like a model of some of the best farming in the world in these lowland areas. Yeah, 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 very much so. You know, and it kind of started in England and, 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 and then moved up and, and you, you'll see accounts uh, of farmers uh, on Isla, uh, for example, uh, being taken down to Northumberland to, to, to learn about this. And it's, so there was a lot of kind of toing and froing taking place. Uh, so uh, people coming up and especially in, in, in the Lothians uh, having a look at, at what goes on. But it's not just agriculture, it kind of impacts on, on the way that society is, is established as well. And a lot of this is kind of prompted by uh, a change in thinking in the part of the land, the Scottish landowners, who wanted to have more cash because they wanted to maintain their lifestyle. So a lot of this is down to fashion. A lot of this is down to 18th century conspicuous consumption. You know, they weren't that well off and they wanted to be dandies. They wanted to be as good as their English and continental counterparts rather than those poor Scots with, you know, holes in their breeks. So there was a need, uh, a desire, and, and all, the, all the, the contemporaneous reports uh, are talking about, you know, this is, this is one... This is one reason for improvements taking place, that landowners wanted more money to be able to build bigger houses and buy nicer clothes. 
and taking on a lot of debt as well. They were greatly indebted by the time this this Usually period started. Debt, because their only income is coming from the land. So this is one reason that they have to improve it. So the, and, and there's a change in mindset that takes place then, which is stopping viewing the land in this kind of paternalistic uh, way and looking at land as a business, uh, as a business that had to be managed. And this new thinking kind of me, uh, on one hand, is imposing uh, a new structure upon it, you know, that the, the land had to make money and it had to make money for the landowner. Uh, and also this coincides with, with the changes in agriculture and that's crop rotation. It's a wider variety of crops coming in. It's grass seed coming in to be, to be planted for, for pasture, uh, pasture land. It's drainage, like drainage tiles, drainage ditches coming in. Uh, machinery is changing as well. So what you're seeing is farms becoming bigger. This is in the beginning of the 18th century. Farms starting to become larger and the creation of villages and small country towns. And this is where the displaced cotters and the subtenants begin to leave. And they're beginning to kind of occupy these new small, small villages and small towns and also drifting into the larger cities. As a result of this, the cotters kind of leave but are essentially kind of re some of them are going to be reemployed as farm laborers, as plowmen in times, as servants for these larger houses which need servants. Uh, and other ones who, who are displaced are going to become artisans. So you see a, a rise in weaving. Uh, you know, my ancestors were, were weavers, and both my mum and, and my dad's side of, side of the family back in the 18th century, probably, you know, for, for this very reason. And in these small towns, you're seeing ancillary industries break, uh, starting up weavers, blacksmiths, wheelwrights, carpenters, etc., etc. And because more people are moving away from the land, there's a greater pressure on the land to be able to produce more food because people aren't going to be producing the food in the cities uh, and, and, and on, in, in these, these small towns. So there's a speeding up of this change in, in agriculture. And what you're seeing, and you still see it today, is that areas of the lowlands are specializing in various areas. So Ayrshire, for example, you're on the, on the west coast of the lowlands, uh, you're getting more uh, more butter, you know, more cheese. Uh, you've got more arable uh, lands on, in the East Lothians and down to Berwickshire. On the borders where the, the, it's slightly higher, that, that's more kind of sheep in there. And Aberdeenshire uh, into cattle as well. So you're seeing this kind of areas of specialization starting up. And one of the centers is East Lothian. Uh, and East Lothian is the first great Scotch whiskey region, I, I, I would argue, you know, from after this, uh, after this research, uh, I'd love to explore more uh, about East, East Lothian. Here's Hadding, Haddington, a, a map of Haddington, and near to Haddington uh, is Ormiston, uh, which was started by a man called Sir John Coburn. Uh, and in 1726, uh, Sir John Coburn uh, plans or, or builds Scotland's first planned village. He puts his farms on longer leases. He establishes this town. It's got industries. It's got linen manufacture. It's got blacksmithing. It's got candle making. And also, and you will begin to wonder, hang on, Dave, you've been talking for about 10 minutes now and you haven't mentioned whiskey. There's a maltings and there's a distillery. It's a distillery run by Mr. Alexander White or perhaps White or Wright. It's, you know, I'm just getting a bit vague in those days. 1726. You've got this integrated system in place. You've got local grain, you've got higher yields, you've got maltings, you've got whiskey. And uh, you can see that these, what they're beginning to do is experiment with new barley varieties uh, coming in. So, so the, there's a couple of couple of extracts here for, from a, a rather uh, lovely book about the, the general view of the agriculture and rural economy of East Lothian. Lovely long title there. Uh, so that's coming. That, that's that's later. That's 1795. Talking about uh, Scottish barley, uh, truest crop for quantity and, quali and quality. And then there, there's a comparison of that to to beer or, or big, uh, as 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 it was also known. And there is Sir David Kinloch of Gilmerton uh, going to Switzerland, a, a species of barley, a six-row barley. Uh, which he informs is very prolific and some of the ears have produced 64 grains. This species of fade, although new to this county, is well known in Aberdeenshire, 
where for its prolific quality, it's called Make Him Rich. And you know, you know all about Aberdonians wanting to be rich. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there, you know, there, there we are. Yeah, I, I know everybody kind of bangs on about, you know, new barley varieties and efficiencies. It's starting in the 18th century, guys. You know, uh, you're wanting better, better quality barley to be able to increase uh, the volumes coming on. And uh, yeah, another quote from there, over the years, uh, some distilleries and one or two starch manufacturers have been erected in this county, which are still carried on. Just to give you an idea of how, how agriculture changed in East Lothian, 1809, uh, from 1809 to 1810, there's 784,000 bushels uh, of malted barley uh, being produced. In 1840, there are 4 million. You know, so this is a grain super superstore. Uh, Can you remember the translation from a bushel? What's the translation? Uh, I you were going to ask me that, and uh, I don't know if it's the law. <laughs> yeah, I should know as well. I've looked yeah, it up yeah, like 10 times. Me bad. What? Uh, yeah. But what you find, you, you begin to look at East Lothian, and over the next kind of 150 years, especially from, you know, middle of the 18th century, rather than a lot big boom in distilling in the 19th century, from the 18th century on, there's at least 13 distilleries uh, in East Lothian. Only Glenkinchy is surviving these days. Uh, but Haddington is, is a centre. And, and thanks to, to my, my dear friend Doug Stone in Milwaukee for, for helping me out with this. I can't go into too much detail, uh, but I really want to start kind of exploding there. And there's a couple of the St. Clemens Wells, which was a well-established distillery that, that only closed in the kind of economic crisis of, of the, the 1850s. And Boggs Distillery, which could be the original Ormiston one, we're, we're still kind of uh, in, investigating that as well. But what is happening with the people, there's fewer people working in the fields, they've either been absorbed into the towns or they've been moved into the cities over a long period of time. And this is one of the great differences between what's happening in the lowlands and what we'll see has happened in the highlands where the clearances were compressed into a very, very short space of time. There's a hundred years to get this system operational. But it's a great example of this kind of planned integration, new rural, rural uh, industries. And for me, it's the start of a commercial whiskey industry. I'm not saying it's the modern uh, we've already established that's 1823, the modern Scotch whisky industry. I think this is the start of the commercial whisky industry. But, you know, East Lothian uh, as a distilling centre, you, you just never really thought of that. Uh, can I, can I briefly, briefly, before yeah. you move on, sure. um, are you uh, talking about East Lothian distilleries that are exporting to England, do you think? Because you no, hear about that. I, I, as far as I, I can tell, they're not. They're, they're, they're exporting probably into the cities. Uh, right. So not they, distilling for rectification into the, gin downtown. To, to the best of my knowledge, they're not distilling for rectification. Okay, uh, interesting. The, the improvements, and, and the same improvements are, are, are taking place in Stirlingshire. Uh, on the on the Hillfoots area and in, in Clackmannanshire, etc., and also also up into Fife, and you begin to see the growth of the Hagues and Steens and what became the nineteenth century uh, grain distillers, which are more kind of uh, concentrated in that area. I I I have a hunch that East Lothian was actually producing something slightly different to that. They That's really also, interesting. They're, they're also conceivably exporting uh, a lot of malting barley. You know, there's breweries starting up. There's breweries in Edinburgh. They might be selling that malting barley for, further north as well. You know, it has become a business. But, I mean, but, so you've got this kind of establishing of a, a change in agriculture and the beginnings of a commercial whiskey industry, starting off there in, in East Lothian and then, uh, then up into Fife. But what happens when we move up to what is now called Speyside. Uh, what happens when the same pressures on landowners and land and the need to change and the desire to change takes place when we move up to uh, areas of, of the highlands? Uh, and I'd like to kind of concentrate here on, on, on the Cabrach, uh, some great work that's just been done by Kieran uh, German and Greg, uh, Gregor Adamson. A, a brilliant, brilliant papers on, on, on illicit distillation in, in the Cabot. And also our dear friend Alan Winchester is doing some great work on, on that as well. And you've got fundamentally different set of circumstances up there. 
because in the poorer lands, so away from that lowland plain, but kind of bordering uh, that lowland plain, you have subsistence farmers. They're in the more remote areas, they've got poorer land, uh, and they've always distilled. You know, distilling whiskey has always taken place because distilling whiskey, you're able to pay your rent because you're going to be earning more money by distilling uh, your, your crop, which might be of, of lower quality than you are going to be able to sell that barley at market. So therefore, as a result of that, and because distillation is legal, home, home distillation or small scale distillation is legal, it is tolerated by landowners. So even when it becomes illicit uh, and, and illegal, the landowners are still essentially turning a blind eye to it because it is getting them income. I'm not going to go into you know, all the details of all the, the different acts, you know, from, from 1786 uh, up to 1823, because we've kind of covered that. That's no, let's just assume that we know that illicit whiskey was being made in large quantities in those parts mm -hmm. of Scotland. And the other element where you're going to begin to see tension uh, being created is the fact that Whiskey making in the north of Scotland, in the Highlands, has a cultural dimension as well as an economic one. And I think much more of a cultural dimension, a cultural dimension meaning an attachment to land and the right to distill your own product, uh, your, own, your own crops, as well as this just being an economic uh, impulse, which you're seeing uh, in, in the, uh, on the lowland plains. And one of the other things that I think is really important to, to emphasize is that these subsistence farmers, these illicit who became illicit distillers, they're not making fortunes. You know, they're not in there making a business of all of this. You know, up until the eighteen twenty three Act, they're barely getting by in 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 selling uh, the, this whiskey to to the smuggling gangs, who they eventually kind of fall fall prey on. Uh, but it's a way to retain their land. So. Going back to the cabaret, I mean, what you see from the beginning of the 19th century, uh, from 1800, 1820, it's estimated there's 80 moonshining stills in the cabaret. Uh, those of you who don't know where the cabaret is, it's kind of eight miles outside uh, outside Dufton, just on, on heading out towards Huntley. That probably doesn't really help. Uh, <laughs> but then, then comes uh, 1823, the 1823 Act, and our good old friend, the Duke of Gordon. You know, the Duke of Gordon rides in and, you know, speaks to the House of Lords and, you know, everything is sorted and, you know, the new Scotch whiskey industry is is born. Uh, speaking with, with Ian Russell, uh, who might be might here tonight, uh, and Ian point, <laughs> pointed out that there is no evidence at all in Hansard that the Duke of Gordon ever said anything in the House of Lords at all. Uh, so, you know, uh, he certainly he certainly helped to promote the bill, but, you know, uh, there's a little bit of uh, whether he was actually a main driver of the 1823 Act, mm, maybe not. Uh, but I think the one thing, looking at this from the agricultural point of view, rather than as we did earlier on from the, the control and the, the establishing of, of a commercial, commercial industry, it was expedient for the landowners to turn a blind eye to illicit behaviour. But they didn't have any love for the moonshiners at all. And there's all many, many accounts, but they had no love for the moonshiners at all. And we'll see that to, to dreadful effect uh, when we move further north into Sutherland. But now it's expedient for of the landowners to act in the same way that, that they had done in the borders and start to view the state as the business. So they have no compunction whatsoever of kicking people off the land. And there is this, again, a kind of assumption that, that was made by, by Tom Devine uh, and, and, and other historians, that it was this automatic move from, well, you had your illicit still, 1823 comes along, as we knock on the door, take out one of these licenses, get yourself up to Elgin, get one of these licenses, boom, and the moonshiner goes legit. It's not true. It's not true. The, the, the ones who became the distillers are hand-picked, and they're hand-picked taxmen, that middle management, like George Smith, you know, who had the tag. You know, he, he wasn't a poor subsistence farmer. He had the tag, the Cummings, established tenants, McGregor at Balmenich, 
or you begin to see partnerships uh, building up, uh, Peary and Bain and Milton Duff, for example, uh, and, and on the Cabrick, uh, moonshine, former moonshining farmers getting together to establish the distilleries there as well. So, so on, on, yeah. on, just on the subject of the taxman, that's extremely interesting. Um, so the taxman, yeah. there is a link to the military and he, the taxman is, is the liaison between the laird or the chieftain, as it may be seen, but the, the powerful man at the top in order yeah. to rally the troops. And that's one of the, um, the payoffs for your land that you are expected to defend those borders effectively and fight, and hence why they felt so betrayed later on. So is there a military link with some of these people like George Smith and McGregor at Balmain? Yeah. Have, have you managed yeah, yeah. to look? Yeah, 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 very much so. You know, and, well, Captain and, George Smith. Captain George Smith. Yeah, he, 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 you know, the, the crippled captain, I, 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 yeah. as he was known. Uh, you know, and a lot of them, you know, uh, human role at, at Tierney. Uh, and certainly yes. you, see, you see a lot of military people moving in, especially after 1823, a lot of the, the distilleries are passed on and moving in, into like 1830s, 1850s. Uh, you, you see a lot of people with military titles uh, taking mm -hmm. taking on uh, control of, of abilities. So undoubtedly, yes, uh, that was the case. They, they, they were handpicked. And the other thing is that now you begin to see a, sh a change in the physical locations of distilleries as well. And in on what we now know as space site, it becomes part of the wider improvements that, that you've already seen in, in East Lothian. And production post-1823 shifts from the back country around clustering around the new towns. Uh, so I mean, if you have a look at what was happening, uh, you see there, there was uh, four or planned villages there, planned villages, planned towns, uh, 490 uh, planned towns in total uh, across Scotland. There's going to be 100 of them uh, uh, up in the northeast. The landowner uh, can charge higher rents, uh, and you see that happening in, in Space Night. 1750, New Keith is established, uh, and soon after that, Strathyla distillery starts up. Uh, you've got 1817, uh, Fife Keith uh, was established by the Earl of, Earl of Fife. Strathmill follows uh, not that long after that, in 1831. Charles Grant founds uh, Aberlour, Charleston of Aberlour, 1812. Uh, Archiston is also established. 1817, you've got Dufton uh, founded by, by the Earl of Fife. 1820, Elgin, uh, which was always kind of the capital, has now kind of, is now improved and expanded. Uh, and as a result, and this is the reason that the intermediate Highland line, the taxation line, is formed. Because mm rather than it just being a straight split uh, as it had been between the lowlands and the highlands all of a sudden you've got commercial distilling uh, starting around all these new towns so you have this extra band this intermediate uh, band of taxation imposed to capture these uh, these new distilleries uh, which are which are beginning to be established and if you begin to see if you begin to look at the map if you flip from one map to the other you can see in the early days, everything is kind of spread away from the towns. They're moonshiners, of course it's going to be. Yeah, you know, it makes it, perfect sense. <laughs> and, soon, and immediately after, you begin to see these clusterings around the towns and eventually along, along the, the, the line of the railway. So the landscape is changing in terms of agriculture and the landscape of whiskey is changing as well. And there's very few of these backcountry distillers, uh, distilleries which are surviving. Uh, so you, begin, you, you can see uh, an idea of, of you know, how many uh, whiskey distilleries are beginning to be established. Uh, they, they're like 51, 67, uh, 53, 1821. You know, uh, that's using malt and grain. That's an interesting one. I, I wonder if that, that just essentially just make, makes mash bills. Uh, you know, big, big hit there in eight, you know, 1827. Everybody's kind of getting on board. And it begins to, to fall away after that. But the location of those uh, is, is very, very interesting. And the shift in agriculture and the shift in whiskey making is also behind the depopulation of a lot of, the, a lot of these areas in the highlands, such as the Cabaret, such as Deeside uh, as well. So some lovely work that I just simply didn't have enough time. I was doing some work on, on what happened in Deeside. 
you know, which was a hotbed of, you know, decided into Braemar, a hotbed of, of illicit whiskey production. And whole shillings are uh, getting destroyed, you know, massive depopulation of, of these Highland glens uh, taking place. Uh, so there was a fundamental relationship between improved agriculture, the, the making the, the starting up of new towns, uh, people moving to the new towns, or essentially cleared off the land completely, which is what we're about to, to start talking about, and the starting up of, of, of commercial distilling. So the nature of whiskey changes, but the map of whiskey changes as well. And it's interesting to see, uh, again, the the loosening of these links between what had been purely a kind of farm-led and agricultural product, because by the time you get to the 1860s in Speyside, that next wave of distilleries are, are owned by speculators. They're, they're no longer taxmen. They, you know, they're, they're business people. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. and, and then the blenders come in as well. So the, the, the ownership shifts and the people who had lived on the land are disenfranchised, you know, if, if they are still, if they are still even in the area itself, they're disenfranchised. They're not buying these distilleries. They might work at them if they're lucky. Uh, there might be employment if they're lucky. So you're beginning to see the, this dramatic shift in, in the rural population uh, and the way in which Scotland is organised. And whiskey is kind of sitting there. At, at, the, at the heart of it. So uh, let's kind of keep moving north. Uh, so we're going to have a, a look now at the north and west and, and, and what is happening there. And that might mean that those of you who, who have studied the clearances at all will, will, will know uh, what happened, uh, certainly on Sky. We've got an example of, uh, but probably not from the beginning of the 19th century, but the late 19th century. Uh, crofters there uh, grinding corn uh, on Skye. So we're going to have a look at uh, Sutherland and Skye uh, in this next section and then we'll move on to uh, an interesting, I think, little comparison between two islands uh, to, to finish this off. So the situation here is different again, so, so kind of north of Inverness and on the west coast and, and the Hebrides. Uh, a much more entrenched clan system, uh, essentially the same, Maybe the chief taxman the tax in this case usually related to, to the chief, subtenants, cotters, everyone having access to land, but a much more kind of rigid class structure uh, and a paternalistic uh, view of it. But you know, you knew your place uh, in, in, in those days. But again, on the part of the, the Highland chiefs, a need to maintain or indeed upgrade uh, this, th this lifestyle. Uh, to, uh, I don't know, how do you put it, to, to uh, establish a lifestyle which they would like to become accustomed to, you know. <laughs> but, but you know, the land is poorer. Uh, the estates are poor. Uh, improvements make sense. There is also, there's also rising population. And uh, this has to be, this has to be accepted that, that there, were, there was overpopulation uh, taking place. Uh, and there was a necessity to try and find ways to deal with this overpopulation uh, and overuse, perhaps, uh, of land. So that there was there was a need to be able to manage this. And the issue for me is the way in which that was managed, or indeed mismanaged, which leads which leads to the clearances. So the improvements weren't actually there improving people or improving people's lots whatsoever. Uh, the depopulation was done in a completely different way. But it was, the, the impulse for it, the, the rationale behind it was there are too many people uh, on the land. So once again, subsistence farming, you've got distilling and you've got cattle as the main sources of income and rent. And again, look back to, look back to, to all the records uh, from the 18th century, 19th century. What are, what are they growing? Well, they're growing oats, and they're growing oats because oats are the staple food. And they're growing bear barley, and the bear barley is there for ale, and the bear barley is there, that's, that's bear on the right. Uh, the bear is there for whiskey uh, because distillation is earning the money. And it's probably carried out by, by groups of six to ten tenants uh, using a central still. Uh, in, in the little kind of uh, communities. Uh, and this is a lovely uh, quote. This is from uh, 
Siege, uh, the Reverend Siege, uh, from his memorabilia domestica, the, the parish life in the north of Scotland. S Siege is a, a fascinating, it's a fascinating book. He was the only minister uh, up there in Sutherland to speak out, speak out against uh, the clearances that, that were taking place. And, and in, in this, he's kind of, uh, he's, uh, in his memoirs, he, he's uh, remembering that this man uh, called John Sutherland, uh, the, the big, uh, the, the middle, the middle one, John the, the middling, uh, in, in Gaelic, <laughs> uh, who inherited his father's passion for angling and deer hunting, and was also in his own way a bit of an antiquary. Yay, we love him. Uh, <laughs> almost all Ossian's poem, all poems, and what I never saw in print, Ossian's tales. So you know, he, here is your local bard, and he's also a smuggler and a first-rate brewer of malt whiskey. And here's an account, uh, his father was a minister as well, and there's an account there of him teaching them uh, and coming along and helping them to make illicit whiskey. Uh, he was a noted, noted distiller, uh, a quality, quality man. And obviously, you know, you, you look at the way in which, which he's written about there by, by Sage, a man who was much loved. Uh, he was forced off the land. He sailed with his family across to, to Canada but died uh, on the voyage. Uh, sadly, uh, a story which is repeated uh, time and time again. And what you're dealing with here are skilled people. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you've got 300 small stills operational in Eastern Sutherland, importing grain, because they couldn't even necessarily get, keep up with, with, with demand. Uh, Strathbrora, Kildonan, uh, centers of, of, of excellence for it, exporting their whiskey, creating businesses. You know, okay, it was it was illicit, but they are creating a business. But here we have the great dilemma, and and this is where it all begins to to, to go go wrong. That you have these farmers who are now facing increased rents because the landowners want to have more money from them. Uh, the only way they can afford to pay it is by making the whiskey. Uh, the whiskey is illegal. Uh, they're caught in this absolute bind at this point. So how do you cope with it? You know, I, 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 if if all of this has to change because of overpopulation and the need to, to raise rent, how can the changes benefit the people who have been forced to become illicit producers? That would be what a, a sensible and a liberal and a caring landowner would think about. However, in Sutherland, we reach, we meet this triumvirate, the, the Marquis of Stafford, uh, there, up there on Ben uh, the Countess of Sutherland, his wife, and their factor, a man called Seller, Patrick Seller, a curse upon his name. Uh, and they built themselves a rather nice uh, castle with the appropriate name, Dun Robin. Uh, so the Marquis of... One Sorry. second, Dave. Um, <laughs> I was a bit distracted earlier because I suddenly remembered we hadn't uploaded it. Mm. Um, but, ta da! <laughs> there we are. Yeah. So, uh, when you see a photo of what the tenants were living in, think back to Dun Robin Castle. Uh, so, the Marcus of Stafford's one of Britain's wealthiest men. Uh, she is one of Scotland's wealthiest women. The holdings that they had accounted were the largest landed property in Victorian Britain. They wanted to raise the revenue, and Seller is the man employed to make it happen. And what you see is a brutal depopulation taking place uh, in Sutherland, starting in 1807, really peaking about 1815, it really kind of, kind of hit its peak. And the, the prime reason for this, and again, this is something that's kind of overlooked, and I was looking through the Sutherland papers, the state papers, and they're being moved, people are being moved off the land to, to be replaced by sheep, massive sheep, uh, sheep runs uh, taking place there. But the prime reason for the move by Patrick Seller in his letters to, to uh, the Duchess is illicit whiskey production. Uh, and this is deeply ironic, as James Hunter points out in, in his great book, because what the, what the tenant farmers were doing was actually working in a free market. You know, the free market values that, that were being promoted by Seller, a uh, great believer, a great, great follower of Adam Smith, were actually working already. 
Uh, but you know, it wasn't allowed. And here you have uh, uh, like three three slides here, uh, uh, looking at from, from these are letters from seller to the Duchess. It, I would entirely bring down the people of Kildonan to this district that's down onto the coast. They pay their rents by smuggling barley brought over the mountains from Caithness, returning the whiskey to that county and Orkney, exporting, and by stealing sheep from the neighbouring farm. Quite right, it's probably his farm. And then uh, a longer extract there of Rogart, uh, crammed with whisky smugglers. Uh, I'm humbly of the opinion that many of the, as many of these people as possible should be put into Brora and the grounds which lie betwixt Strastriven in the west, uh, Controdwell on the north and Los Beg on the east. Uh, so this is moving people, forcibly moving people off the land, burning them out of their houses uh, uh, to move them down into the coast. Not exporting them, not forcing them into emigration, but forcing them to leave their lands and sit there and and, and uh, start to populate the coast. Uh, and then the, the next one, it, it kind of the next couple uh, begin to give you an idea. Uh, so there, there we have, uh, again, uh, their chief employment is the importation of grain from Caithness, the illicit distillation of it in their impenetrable fastnesses into whiskey and the transportation of it in that shape back to the low country, as I was saying, uh, exporting. So, and here we are, move them down, uh, place them in lots under the size of three arable acres, sufficient for the maintenance of an industrious family, but pinched enough to cause them to turn their attention to the fishing. In other words, small enough, they cannot be self-sufficient anymore. They can't produce enough food from their own land to be able to feed the family. Uh, mm -hmm. And the rents are incredibly high and the way that they're going to get their employment is taking farmers from the interior and saying, right, become fishermen straight away. Uh, quite extraordinary. And then there, there's a real kind of racist uh, element uh, to, to a lot of what he's, he's writing about, uh, a hatred of, of Gaelic, uh, and also, uh, you can see there, uh, his children, this is talking about uh, the children of, of a smuggler. His children, tangled, trained up in deceit, exceed their father in turpitude, and the virtue of a Scotch Highlander is exchanged for the vices of the Irish peasantry. You know, so that is, you know, the lowest of the low, according to Seller, is the Irish pe peasantry, uh, and they are uh, debased people because they are making illicit whiskey. Uh, and speaking Gaelic, so it's it, it's a dreadful, dreadful. It's chilling to to, to read these letters. It's brutal social engineering. Uh, I, I know a lot of emotion is uh, you were saying kind of expounded uh, in these tales, but it's a story that needs to be told and, and keeps needing to be told. Uh, and it's the complete opposite here. Of uh, yeah, so, so so I mean, yeah, once again, uh, yeah, uh, another quote here. People in an accessible country can't escape. The trade therefore falls into the hands of the Highlander who lives in an inaccessible country. So Seller's rationale here uh, is that moving people down to the coast uh, means that they can keep an eye on them. Uh, you know, basically police uh, what, what they're, they're going to be doing. So you have, as I said, uh, people cleared, their, their houses burned out, uh, sheep are replaced, uh, you know, a few stats, 1814, Strath Brora, Kildonan, up to 200 communities, Strath Naver to 2,000 people. Uh, they were fertile areas. Uh, you know, they were exporting the, the, their surplus. Uh, 4,000 cattle uh, were, were in Kildonan. Uh, it was sustainable. Mm -hmm. it, it could have been sustainable, uh, but, but the sheep came in. And it's in this area, and Sutherland, uh, yeah. And this guy, the, the they call him the Manny, I think that statue there. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the area where, in modern times, fashion run the deepest, isn't it? And really, since the rise of twentieth uh, century Scottish nationalism in fifties and sixties, maybe seventies, mm -hmm. I think, and and you start to see this statue vandalised and a movement for it to be pulled down, um, blown up. Uh, yeah. Mm. Ex yeah, etc. Uh, and and part of it's because you know they, they were assiduous in, in keeping the records, so, so you can go to those estate papers 
and see exactly what, what, what was taking place. And then the accounts of, of the people who were removed off the land as well, and accounts such as Sage as well. So it was actually remarkably well documented, uh, to, 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 to be perfectly honest. So, I mean, so, so what you're saying, there's a sheep, I've got nothing against sheep, you know, sheep are lovely. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> uh, the, the, the sheep, are, sheep are replacing the people. Mm -hmm. uh, they all moved to the coast and moved to Helmsdale and Brora, Galsby and Dornach. Uh, they're imposed, this is the imposition of the crofting system, uh, where the, the lots were pinched. Uh, you can't feed your family. Uh, you've, you, they have to be forced into other employment, also into kind of seasonal employment as well. So they're, they're immediately poor because they're, they're unable to, to grow the crops and the jobs aren't lasting uh, the, the entire year. Part of the deal was that bringing barren land into cultivation. And you see that uh, in Sutherland, you also see in Harris, uh, you know, the people move from, from the Fertile Macher on, on the West Coast to essentially living on rock uh, on the East Coast uh, and accounts uh, on Harris kind of shrugging, going, well, why aren't they just fishing, you know? Uh, and also the rents are rising and rising and rising. So if you're going to replace this with subsistence economy, what are you going to be replacing it with? Uh, in Brora, well, they tr the, the, the Marquis tried to turn Brora into Ormston. There's, well, that's in Barra, but essentially, you know, th there you have uh, the Croft uh, sitting there on rock, a clearance Croft. Uh, so Klein Leash is a clearance distillery, you know, established in 1819. Uh, it was a brewery in 1815. There were brickworks. Uh, <laughs> Exporting drainage tiles. Now there's an irony. Uh, there was a coal, there was a coal mine <laughs> which was restarted. There was salt making, all of which founded. To be honest, the salt mine closed 1828. So did the coal. So did the brickworks. Uh, the distillery founded as well around about the, around about the same time and was eventually saved. Uh, and also the people running the distillery imported. So the southern clearances are deservedly infamous for the brutality and the compressed nature of it you know rather than the hundred years that, that, that you saw in the lowlands uh you go right boom you're out uh and the same thing is going to be happening on sky as well and again another clearance distillery on sky uh thanks to the, the, this lovely man called Hugh McCaskill and thanks a lot to uh Joe McCarker for, for helping me out there's too many Hughes and too many Kenneth McCaskills in the sky at this particular point. <laughs> uh, so, ta so Talscorp was founded in 1830 by, by Hugh McCaskill, you can see there. Uh, he was a laird of Calgary on Mull. He had cleared Morinch uh, on Mull. He took the tack of Talisker in the early 1920s. Uh, he cleared 56 families uh, on his increasingly large estate. Uh, Again, replacing them with sheep, moving them into some of them into smaller areas such as Carbost. Uh, and if you go to Talisker, uh, and please do go to Talisker, I, I, I love Talisker, I love Sky, uh, amazing, amazing place. Uh, you, you can see in, in the display in the visitor center the tokens which the workers were given uh, as, as their pay, and the tokens were only redeemable at the Caskill shop. So there you go. I don't think I need to add anything on there. Uh, no. His brother uh, took over, he, he was sequestrated. Uh, so in other words, his, his assets were seized. His brother took over, brought in a, a distiller from Campbellton uh, and uh, 1857, uh, Kenneth, his brother died at the distillery. Uh, so, and, and there's, there's some interesting quotes uh, from, from later on, uh, if you could maybe bring them up there. So this is the eviction of McLeod's, McLeod and McLeod's property, which is uh, under McCaskill there, uh, about having the sheep having the, their ears cut off uh, to be claimed by McLean, who was the previous tag, tag owner, and then uh, then McCaskill. Uh, and uh, down here, the McCaskill family came to poverty at last. They went to the dogs. Uh, you know, but you, you can see it's a, it's a very interesting account there. You know, the whole of Minganish was heard, held by McCaskill, and it's now in the hands of two tenants. You know, so th there's a populous part of Sky. The Sky Clearances is where it was brutal as those in Sutherland as well. And then for, for those of you who want uh, an interesting alternative history of the founding of, of Talisker, uh, 
again, we've got clearances here. The McLeod family began the clearances in McCask and finished them. Uh, there was another township near Carbos Beg uh, in which there were four families who were very well off. The daughter of a widow told me her father had given Hugh McCaskill £180. It's a lot of money uh, mm. to help him when he came to Talisker. But when the place was cleared, he removed her mother along with the others. This woman saw her father's corn shoved into the river when the place was cleared to make a distillery. Oof. There you go. Nice man. Uh, you don't really see that in the official history of Talisker, but uh, uh, it, it has to be owned. It has to be owned. Uh, so, like, yeah, 700 families uh, on, on Sky uh, being evicted. The same is happening in Razi. The same is happening in Arden Merkin. It's happening in Morven. It's happening in Mull. It's happening all across uh, the, the, west, the West Coast. So what you're seeing here is this kind of obliteration of, of culture, of ways of farming, uh, the forcible moving and depopulation uh, of, of areas. And in some cases, and what you see in, in certainly in Sutherland and, and over there on Sky, in some cases, uh, the establishing of, of, of distilleries, whereas in fact in the past, a lot of whiskey uh, would in fact uh, have been have taken place. So you've got this kind of speedy uh, approach rather than this kind of gradualist approach which you saw in the lowlands. And an element of kind of nurture to some extent in the lowlands, uh, a kind of brutal coercion essentially uh, that, that, that's taking place uh, in, in the highlands as well. Some landowners opened distilleries, uh, Mackenzie of Seaforth opened one on St in Stornoway, uh, it was wildly over ambitious. He didn't understand that he just wanted to make money. That closed uh, fairly quickly. But you see the islands, you see the peninsulas, you see the glens, all clear. But we're going to come back to that. And I wanted to kind of draw this draw this to a close uh, with a kind of what if, you know? Uh, there was a little kind of depression there. Yeah, and, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a really fascinating, quite kind of tragic what if. Uh, between two islands, the island of Tyree and the island of Isla. Uh, both are islands, uh, both are fertile, both were noted for distilling. Uh, in fact, Tyree, there's some debate over what Tyree means. One of, one of, the, one of the possible meanings of, of, of the name of the island is Tiranyorna, which is the land of barley. But have you ever heard of Tyree whiskey? Well, hopefully you will soon, because there hopefully will be a distillery on, on, on Tyree. But have you ever heard of it? Have you ever heard of Tyree being a whiskey producing island? Mm -mm. 1849, Dean Monroe. No country may be more fertile of corn. The landlord's rent is paid in grain. 1868, James Turnbull's report. Barley, small oats and rye. All the different kinds of grain which are sown here. The greatest quantity of which is barley. And you know what barley is used for. Barley is used for meal not for eating, it's used for meal, it's used for whiskey. 1770, 1700 people being supported in reasonable style. Cattle are being exported, whiskey is being exported, salt beef is being exported. Before 1786, and uh, for the Distilling Act in 1786, much of that barley is being made into spirits. Uh, there's 50 legal stills in the 1850s. 1791, I'm just rattling the, these ones off. Tyree had exported up to 200 to 300 gallons a year from 30 stills at the tail end of the 18th century. But by 18, 1796, in the old statistical account of, of Scotland, which was written by ministers, which frustratingly has very little about whiskey in it because they were all teetotal, uh, mm -hmm. the people of Tyree tell a far superior increase in grain when the land was in good condition. Now ground is set, set into smaller portions and the lands are impoverished. So the soil is not being improved. And you see Tyree going into this spiral of decline. So what went wrong with Tyree, Arthur? Do you want to see this guy? Yeah, here we have the fifth Duke of Argyle, John Campbell, who inherited uh, the estate, massive estate, uh, of Argyll, which included Camelton, uh, in 1770. He was a keen improver. And his initial aim for Tyree is absolutely by the book. Reclaim some land, introduce new seeds, don't 
put it over to sheep or huge farms, uh, medium-sized farms, crop rotations, new villages, uh, communications, sort of packet going going either up to Mull or over to the, the mainland, developing weaving, developing fishing. 1785, he founds two distilleries. Uh, he begins to clamp down on illicit production, uh, which we'll see in a second, uh, despite it being an important way of paying rent. So there's a misstep. Uh, the distilleries, incidentally, are, are, are run off coal because the peak uh, stocks are beginning to be d diminished. But the investment, the massive investment that was required was simply not followed through. So there wasn't any drainage put in, there wasn't any seed arriving, there was no new blood stock coming in, there was no packet established, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you have a resistance on the part also of the people of Tyree because he's a Campbell and they were owned by the Maclean's so and there's kind of hangover from the 1745. And the factor, so instead of taxmen, you've now got factors coming in like, like seller. And he was an incomer uh, and probably he might have been bilingual, but he probably spoke English as well. So there's cultural, there's cultural tension uh, at, at the heart of this as well. So in 1803, the Duke changes tag, if I can use the term, completely. This is complete kind of vault fast on, on, on his part. He moves completely away from, from his original idea, divides those townships into crofts, into pinched land, because there is a new potential generator of greater profit, and that is kelp seaweed uh which is collected and and burned and turned into fertilizer there's a boom in in kelping at the beginning of the 19th century because of the napoleonic wars because prior to that it was all coming in from from, from spain uh so there's kelpers and a croft uh on tyree this is significant because some people are and this is 1803 some people are already emigrating at this point. 830 people leave uh, the Highlands uh, and emigration in 1801, 3,300 in 1802. In 1803, 20,000 people are applying for emigration. And the Passenger Vessels Act of June 1803 is then passed, lobbied for by the landowners, which makes uh, emigration passage prohibitively expensive in order to keep this large workforce in place that's needed for kelping. And essentially what, what they're doing, what, what Jacob Argan, this is particularly prevalent in, uh, in US and right up uh, on, the, on the, the outer isles. Uh, it's like a plantation economy. You know, it's very similar uh, to, to, to what's happening over, the, over there uh, on, on the Caribbean. And the population is rising and rising. As the population is rising, so those lots are beginning to be shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and further and further, and poverty is growing, and poverty is growing. And also illicit distilling continues. And there's an extraordinary amount of illicit distillation uh, that's taking place on Tyree. So, so there's, again, so, so pull through that some of the, the, the estate papers from uh, from Argyle, uh, you can see, you know, uh, well, that's, that's still Sky, that one. Oh, I beg your pardon, yep. That's so. right. It's fine. Uh, so he's trying to clamp down. This is Ferrier, who, who, who's, who's the, the factor there, 1787. As you mentioned, two license stills are proposed to be erected on the island. Uh, you should take measure for having both erected as they may be carried on with coal uh, and see that they are so carried on. Otherwise, they'll soon waste the little fuel we have. So that's, that's Pete. But none could be found on the island willing to undertake the distilling in a legal way. And it's submitted to your grace whether in the future any such should be encouraged as it may produce too great facility of procuring spirits to which the natives are much addicted. So again, you've got this drunken Highlander thing uh, taking through, coming through. And then there's 157 people arrested uh, for illicit distillation on Tyree. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you think, my God, that's going to be a lot of whiskey, isn't it? Uh, and this is the proposal. Uh, this, His Grace is pleased to order uh, that every tenth man of these 157 be deprived of their present possessions and of all protection from him in future. It is left to Major Maxwell and you to set, select the ringleaders and most idle and worthless 
or to lay the punishment on the whole 157 by lot as you think best. And what essentially happens to the people who are, who are selected uh, out of that is that they are forcibly uh, emigrated. So kicking people off the land. The kelp market collapses uh, in 1820. Uh, but th th this, this is another reason for that secondary shift and that secondary move in, in terms of uh, depopulation, uh, that you've got the Outer Isles, you've got Ardnamurchan, you have Morvern, uh, all beginning to, to, which were reliant on kelp. Suddenly you've got people who have no money uh, coming in uh, whatsoever. And sort of new statistical account from 1845 saying, though Tyree has been a good deal noted as an agricultural island, and though a considerable quantity of produce is annually raised and exported, the crops in general are light and of inferior quality. There you have it. You know, uh, the island is, is ruined. You have the depression, financial depression, economic depression, 1830s, 1846, uh, 1843, you have uh, the potato famine, uh, and potatoes were by then the only the staple diet, the staple crop, because potatoes were the only thing that could be grown in such in such uh, <clears throat> tight areas as Crofts. Uh, 1846, you're seeing forced emigration and forced emigration beginning to start. Uh, it was the only solution, but the problem was thanks to total mismanagement on on, on, on the part of of these large landowners. Just uh, one point there, Dave, as well. I, I am not for a moment defending the large landowners, but I think there was an element also that I read about the kelp price being artificially high yeah. caused by Napoleonic Wars. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, kelp was always short term. You know, if you look at the Argyle papers, the Duke of Argyle, before he has this sudden vault fast, is wary about kelp because he knows it's just going to be a short term thing but then is seduced into those kind of large, admittedly short-term profits, and the people pay. And his distilleries closed down as well. <laughs> so suddenly you've got no whiskey uh, being made uh, on Tyree on an island that could have supported distilleries. And this is one of my points, is that the map could be so, so different uh, had the management of improvements uh, been taken, you know, been, been operated in, in a more consistent and fair manner. And but, really, but, yeah. But even then, you've already moved people to these coastal areas. The forced emigration isn't happening. In actual fact, they they want people. They don't want people to emigrate. And you, I think you hear tales of people threatening to emigrate because yes. they know yeah, that's yeah, what I mean, the yeah. landowners don't want. Yeah. But um, but even then, even though you've got that misfortune, I suppose, of the kelp market collapsing, you've already moved people from the places where they wanted to live. It may only be 30 miles and a couple of hundred years of occupation there potentially is is, is moved because you need them for the summer in, in for, yes. for kelp yeah. manufacture. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's an utterly extraordinary piece of bungled, bungled thinking. I, I, you know, I, I, I think the Duke of Argyle, the fifth Duke, was misguided. I, I don't think he, he was a profoundly heartless uh, as as what you see in other landowners. I think he was misguided. I think he, boom, he suddenly, you know, it was like one of these cartoons, you know, you know, sort of Looney Tunes, you know, you know, bouncing <laughs> in his eyes. Uh, but, but when he heard about kelp, uh, that's from the John O'Groat Journal uh, from uh, eighteen thirty. And this is a letter from somebody to to the the Duke of Sutherland, uh, the Marcus of Stafford, the Duke of Sutherland, uh, essentially pleading with, with the Duke uh, to allow him, this person, to to ship people across to 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 Canada because they wanted to leave uh, because because the, the the poverty was so great. Uh, so that is what is that's what's happening. More people are leaving. Uh, the mass emigrations actually take place after the clearances. Clearance is about depopulation, and then the emigration takes place essentially from the 18, 1850s onwards. But here's here's what happened in Isla. Let, let's compare Tyree to Isla. <clears throat> Isla's fertile. Uh, 
not all of the land was improved or not, and not all of the land was, was, was reclaimed. The improvements start under Daniel Campbell, uh, the elder, 1726. He brings in flax. The taxmen, who, who were kind of pretty lazy, uh, had, all, had all left. Uh, his grandson, Daniel Campbell, the younger, from 1750s, builds a new administrative centre uh, on the island, which is Bomoor. Uh, establishes uh, the packet, which is going to be taking freight, etc., and equipment, blah, 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 uh, to the mainland. Uh, free seeds given out to the farmers. Uh, improvements are encouraged, not always taken up, but encouraged. The keys at Bomor, uh, at Bomor Potaski have extended. Uh, there's no massive farms. There's linen ma manufacturing, there's mining, uh, there's some fishing taking place. Perhaps the distillery. Uh, there's still some debate as to whether Bromor is quite as old as it says it is. But anyway, we'll gloss over that one. Walter Campbell, uh, there's a big clamp down in illicit distilling, 1770, 1816. This is happening all across the place. People continue to be leaving, but there's none of this mass depopulation uh, that's taking place. The crofting system isn't established uh, on, on Isla. New barley strains are introduced, mixed crops are introduced, and Isla is by the the turn of the 19th century is seen as the model of other islands. And that's from Sinclair's general view of the agriculture of the Hebrides. And then Walter Frederick Campbell uh, from 1816 to 1848, he's kind of the great transformer, uh, resists clearance, resists sheep farming, builds Port Ellen in 1811, builds Port Charlotte in 1821, builds Port Weems in 1833. Port Ellen and Port Charlotte, as well we know, have distilleries. Uh, other distilleries are founded. Lagavulin is already a, a, a settlement there. Distillery at, at Lagavulin, distillery at Ardbeg. A village starts up at Ardbeg. The movement of people from the middle of the island out to, to the periphery, but with supporting economy on there. Ultimately, Isla has 16 distilleries at that point. And even with, with seven of them failing, and all distilleries, loads of distilleries failed in the 19th century. That's a very, very high percentage of success. And it's not like the whole of Isla was transformed in, into arable land. Uh, what I really want to do, I, I didn't have sufficient time to do this, is actually look at the relative fertility and comparing Tyree and Isla in terms of the amount of, of, of available land and, and extrapolate from that uh, well, how Many distilleries, Tyree, for example, could have supported had, had things been been different. Uh, what happens in, in the potato famine is that, that Campbell tries to finance all the relief himself, doesn't accept the, the charity, the charitable boards, which were set up, uh, encourages immigration, pays for, for, for pe people to leave, and, and, and landowners did, did pay for people to leave, so pay their, pay their passage. He was bankrupted uh, as a result of all of that. Uh, but without him, uh, where would Isla be? Isla, conceivably, a different landowner, could have ended up like Tyree, could have ended up like Aris or Lewis or, or Mull. So kind of in, in, in summary, I, I realise I've kind of been rambling on, I hope people are still with us. Uh, the interesting thing that, that, that happened uh, at the end of this is uh, something that was chatting to Alan Winchester about. He said, you have to remember the, about the Crofter's Revenge, Dave. Uh, the Crofter's Revenge was that cheap wool began to come in uh, from Australia and New Zealand, and cheaper grain began to come in from Canada, grown uh, by the crofters who had been kicked off their land. Uh, so, you know, uh, the, the, the crofters' re revenge uh, that took place. But, you know, I, I, I've used Tyree as an example here, and this could have been, it could have been anywhere uh, on the West Coast. It's an interesting, I could have made a comparison between what happened to the, and to Ross and Cromarty, to the south, just above Inverness, to the, to the south of Sutherland, and what happened in Sutherland. Ross and Cromarty improved. More distilleries built, built up there. And I just think whiskey's role in the shaping of this new Scotland has been under-investigated. It, mm -hmm. it was central to the old economy, and it could have offered a way out. But you've got this, you've got this racism, you've got this zealotry, you've got this short term, short termism, you've got a refusal to invest, you've got a lack of a gradualist approach 
this kind of perfect storm of uh, which prevented uh, a different whiskey industry <clears throat> from establishing in areas where whiskey making had been uh, ha had become you know, people people were, were experts you know there, there was an expertise to distilling in, in these places and it's the role and the different approaches of, of the landowners that are going to result in, in this kind of misery and and you know you think of it and you look at the whiskey map now and you look at isla and you look at Speyside, and you look at campbellton which is owned by jika Bergano, uh and you go oh well you know those were the centers of excellence you know and a clean this clean shift from illicit distillation into legal distillation you know moonshiners etc etc it's not true as we've seen it's not true but whiskey can be used, I think, as a measure for the impact of the improvements and the effects of the clearances. And the places where whiskey flourished were often the, the new sites and areas where there'd been more carefully planned shift in society and the creation of this kind of integration of, of various different small industries. And look at the map, you know, look at the map and look at the gaps, you know, look at the places where there are no distilleries and look at the rates of depopulation in those areas and look at how the, the improvements were handled or mismanaged. Many of these gaps could have been filled. There's absolutely no guarantee that all the distilleries which could have existed would have succeeded. But Tyree could have supported a distillery. You really could not only support one distillery, I doubt it. Could Sky only support one distillery? I very much doubt it. There should be distilleries down in, down in Slate in the garden. Uh, the Garden of Sky. What of the West Coast? What about the Outer Isles? What about Deeside? The map of whiskey could have been hugely, hugely different. And also, uh, and, and this is and this is kind of speculation on my part, uh, there's this loss of culture as well. You know, the, the clearances saw the end of the Gallic tradition of whiskey making. And there's this kind of existential dimension to it as well, I think, Arthur, this kind of loss of a connection to land and I think at this point, this is the start of whiskey becoming more product-led, becoming more of an industry rather than rather than something which is coming from place. Okay, I mean, you know, the land couldn't have supported all the people. But for these areas to succeed, a, a clearer vision, you know, had, had, had to be devised. And there's still in, in, immense untapped potential in the Highlands. Uh, and whiskey is kind of there. It's sitting there in the middle of it all. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's agriculture, but it's an industry. It created employment, but hastened depopulation. It was blamed for problems, yet recognized by means for change. It benefited some areas, and it was it, the lack of a, a whiskey industry in other areas hastened that, that depopulation uh, and their, their uh, decline. And this is how the modern whiskey industry was created. The shift meant larger sites, it helped to give volume. Uh, the volume could then be exported and consumed by the large expat community, many of whom were the people who had been forced into immigration in the first place. But whiskey, see, my, my, my belief is that whiskey is not peripheral to all of this. Whiskey is at the heart of all of these changes, but it really hasn't been talked about. And what's left, you know, you're, 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 what's left at the end of it? You know, you've got this kind of blank romantic canvas of Scotland, you know, the, the, the empty glens or the emptied glens, you know, the wonderful kind of romantic vistas uh, of, you know, deserted hillsides. Uh, the creation of this very different image for Scotland, which was created by people from the lowlands. Uh, and it's, you know, the, the image of, of, and the development of Scotchland uh, is, is something that, that I know both of us really want to start examining in terms of the imagery that's used to, to try and sell whiskey at the tail end of the 19th century, which is a cliched view of what the Highlands uh, were. And as, as Neil uh, Mackenzie points out, the, 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 you've got this kind of dismissal of the Highlands as being worthless and the Highlanders as being lazy. And you see it time and time again in all of these state papers and a lot of these reports. And this is a kind of, it's obviously completely wrong, but it has been used as an excuse really right up until very, very recently to stop investment. 
And because of that, you've got this long-term continuing depopulation of the highlands and islands. But anyway, anyway, uh, I, 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 want, I want to finish on, 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 on a positive note because look at what, what's happening to whiskey. Well, hang on. Before you uh, finish on a positive note, we just have to show. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, so this is in the Lismore uh, in, in Partick, uh, uh, which is an amazing, amazing pub. Uh, today's Grey Day, by the way, a uh, celebration of the work, life and work of Al uh, uh, Alistair Grey. Uh, I, I used to have the old drink with Alistair in, in, in the Lismore. Uh, and the, the decor of the Lismore is it's beautifully done. Uh, and it's you know, themed around the Highland Clearances. And in the gents' toilet, uh, the urinal dedicated to the three men who participated in the Scottish Highland Clearances. Please feel free to pay them the respect that they are due. <laughs> you know, so there you go. Patrick Seller. There we are. Yes. So anyway, anyway, positive. Uh, look at where the look at where the really exciting new distilleries are. Uh, Razi, Tor of Aig, uh, whose new whiskey is fantastic, utterly fantastic. Harris, McNean, and you know, I, I went around all of them last year, and in that kind of tiny little gap that, that we were allowed to, to travel in, in, in the UK, uh, all of them show what a distillery can do to an area. A new distillery. Investment comes in, distillery ripples out across the community, it revives a community. And Razi's case and Harris's case, it's reviving an island itself. Could that happen in Tyree? The plans are afoot. It's only taken 200 years for, for, for this to happen, but it is happening. And, you know, Arden and Merkin is evidence of how this is possible. It's again that kind of what if uh, that's to, you know that, that lies at the heart of of this this discussion or lecture. Arden Merkin, thank you guys for 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 sparing us uh, the, 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 these these wonderful bottles. It's an awesome dram, and I'm so so excited about what's happening on on the west coast and, and, and the Hebrides at the moment. It's a it's a genuine new start and. When you talk to the people, and not just working at the distillery, with the people in, in the communities themselves, you know how important is the distillery? My God, it's changed the place. Uh, you know, with that, that could have happened before. Uh, but yeah, so there you go. Dave, congratulations! I've little to add except thanks. Um, I'm getting a lot of echo. I don't know if other people are, so I'm not going to talk on too long. But. Um, I think it's a really interesting launching off point for more study, you know, set me loose on some papers, let me study more of these areas, because until you'd highlighted East Lothian, I would just skim over those. I was kind of dismissing those as, uh, as an area that was just producing for export, for rectification down south. I wasn't even looking at Tyree. I wasn't even, you know, you, you're drawn to these kind of areas where, distilleries continued and were successful and that you fell in love with, like Talisker, for example. I would maybe just say about some of the Diageo distilleries, we've mentioned Klein Leash or old Klein Leash brewers we talk about, and Talisker. These were different people. Oh, gotcha. And, yeah, 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 yeah. And this landscape was largely empty, and actually they played a role in keeping that industry through some very difficult times in those regions also and provided employment in those areas also um, and that's probably slightly underplayed actually when we talk about how important the fact that what did survive in those particular areas kept employment throughout the 20th century through some pretty difficult times in those regions um, but uh, and as I say DCL, Diageo, uh, what, what, Guinness, whatever we called them, they, they were different people yeah, but, no, no, I, I, I agree. No, it's, a, it's a really important point. And, and it's interesting looking at the history of, say, uh, Clyde Leash, Stroke, uh, Barora, and, and Talisker. It really, it, it was really at the tail end of the 19th century that, that they began to be managed properly. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of the ones which were landowned or owned were pretty badly run in, in, in those early days. And they, they kind of, they almost, they almost found or they, they almost went and, and then they were revived, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I agree a hundred percent. You know, uh, and and it's something that I think 
people are beginning to realize you know how many how many people are in remote areas are employed by the whiskey industry and the ancillary industries around the whiskey industry as well you know whether that's transportation or farming or 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 coopering or, or or whatever you know whiskey becomes central to to uh scotland's rural uh economy but it could do so much more uh yeah. you know I, I, and there are areas in scotland you know which which can begin to start prospering and begin to build communities thanks to whiskey uh, coming in so so yeah you know, th th that's a really positive way way, way to end up but yeah and I'm, I'm certainly not accusing not accusing diageo of being clearance landlords <laughs> but <they're> absolutely <laughs> and and it doesn't stop me loving brora and it is fantastic that brora and Kleinleach, Kleinleach is still going, but they are going to effectively rebuild Brora as it shut in 83. And Tarasker is a distillery that we should all continue to love because it is brilliant. Uh, I think it's a, the first proper single malt I had. Um, the first improper single malt I had was Loch Du. Um, I loved them bugs. Um, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say that Tarasker <laughs> is still absolutely fantastic. But this these new distilleries and this interesting connection to land and place and there's a whole terroir discussion going on that I don't particularly enjoy and like but mm -hmm. because partly it masks the, what I think is a really important thing which is the connection to communities and place and farming um, which is more important to me than you know these very fine-grained discussions over impact on flavour place yeah. people so important to this beautiful is place you know it's just it's as simple as that and place 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 is culture you know it's, uh... exactly culture dave thank you so much i think this is a huge contribution um i know i'm going to watch it again and probably <laughs> again <laughs> but it's been such a a, a personal pleasure uh, to watch it and we've had some amazing people watching today. Oh, cool. uh, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Some of the names who've been following all along, but also people like Colin Dunn have been joining in. Hey, cool. John, Lam John Lamond, uh, uh, um, Winchester. Uh, he was. Oh, uh, Winchester. I, I, a bushel is 19.05 kilograms. I knew. <laughs> yeah. I knew if there was one person in the world who would know what bushel was, it would be Alan Winchester. I think that that comment came in 4.2 seconds after I had uh, I had asked what a bushel was as well. So um, I, I really hope people share and refer back to this talk because talk, I think it's extremely important, Dave. Well done. Um, that's it. You deserve a rest. I, I deserve a tram. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, yeah. Thank you again. Whiskey drinkers, multi choice. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, don't know what we're going to do next month. Um, going to aim for another couple of episodes, I think. Um, yeah. And we'll find uh, something. Yeah, I, I'm slightly embarrassed. I did drunk babies now, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I love the drunk babies. <laughs> did you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> great. I'll see you soon, my friend. Cheers. Right. Cheers, man. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye.